BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Cha Xiao Pork. Mi Zhi Cha Xiao. Chop, chop, chop goes the cleaver on the board. The halved duck, bones and all, cut neatly into pieces. Slice, slice, slice through the cha shao pork and the roast pork belly. Behind the chef with his knife and block, the roasted meats hang magnificently in the window, a slab of pork belly with a golden frizz of crackling skin. Bundled strips of crimson cha shao glistening with syrup, edges scorched and jagged. Roast ducks hang at jaunty angles, their crumpled skin glossy as lacquer. The chef chops and slices, lays the cut meats on beds of steaming white rice, spoons over a trickle of treacly sauce, hands them to the waiters, who relay them to the customers, who, like me, wait, chopsticks poised, mouths watering. My Chinese food adventures took off when I was in my late teens in London's Chinatown. A Singaporean friend led my cousin and me between the writhing dragons that flanked the dim sum emporium Chen Chen Ku for a Sunday lunch of steamed buns and dumplings and prawns in rice paper. Some years later, as a postgraduate student, I went to live in China, where I began to devote myself to the study of Chinese cuisine. Whenever I was back in London, I frequented Chinatown for meals with friends. Chinatown was the place where anglicised set menus met proper Chinese food, where tentative Westerners could find a foothold in boneless beef in black bean sauce and crispy duck with pancakes, while Cantonese families and anyone more adventurous could gather for a feast of stir-fried calamari laced with pungent fish sauce, spiced duck hearts and emerald pea shoots. Ornate red gates marked the entrance to Chinatown, and strings of red lanterns swayed in the breeze. Along with these decorative flourishes, the barbecued meats suspended in restaurant windows were a visual emblem not just of London's Chinese district, but of Chinatowns worldwide. They were a Chinese delicacy on which both Chinese and non-Chinese tastes could agree. They were relatable for Westerners accustomed to eating roasted meats and poultry. And yet, unlike the sweet and sour pork balls that emerged from the collision of Chinese foodways with 1970s British palates, they were authentically Chinese. Cha Shao pork was a direct culinary import from Hong Kong and the Cantonese south of China, one of a family of delicacies known as siu mei, roasted and barbecued flavours. And yet it began to dawn on me, as I learned more, that despite their iconic status, cha shao pork and those other roasts were far from typical of Chinese cuisine. In three decades of eating in China, I've never seen anyone roasting meat at home. Until Western-style baking and fitted kitchens began to appeal to young urbanites in the early 21st century, virtually no one in China had an oven. The majority of restaurants still don't. When I trained as a chef at the Sichuan Higher Institute of Cuisine, there was no roasting or baking on the curriculum. In most of China, both cooking methods have long been left to specialists, to the roast duck vendors with their huge domed ovens, the Cantonese siume masters and the commercial bakers. If you want to eat roast meat at home, you buy it from a cook shop or a specialist restaurant and serve it alongside homemade dishes. When I was a student at the Sichuan Institute, I was surprised to find that our textbook began by describing the prehistoric discovery of fire and the origins of cooking. Alluding to a famous phrase in the ancient Book of Rites, it said humans had been able to leave behind the desolate epoch of drinking blood and eating feathers, otherwise known as eating raw food, through the harnessing of fire. It was hard to imagine a European culinary textbook 
finding it necessary to go back as far as the origins of cooked food to make the point that cooking is what separates us from savages. But this textbook, with its strange mixture of Marxist theory and classical illusion, was no local eccentricity, because the idea that cooking liberated people from a feral past and marked the birth of human civilization is one that has pervaded Chinese culture since the dawn of history. The age-old Chinese belief that cooking is what separates civilised human beings from savages and animals strikingly prefigures the work of later Western thinkers and scientists. The primatologist Richard Wrangham has argued that cooking literally made us human because heating ingredients unlocked their nutrients, sparing us the exhausting labour of crushing and chewing and allowing us to mainline the nourishment that would grow our brains from ape-like organs into computers capable of scientific and philosophical thinking. But if cooking was key to the evolution of humans in general, only the Chinese have placed it at the very core of their identity. For the ancient Chinese, the transformation of raw ingredients through cooking marked the boundary not only between humans and their savage ancestors, but between the people of the civilised world, that is, China and its antecedent states, and the barbarians who lived around its edges. Eating cooked food was a bridge to civilization. In an early example of gastro-diplomacy, and perhaps even the notion of soft power, one writer of the 2nd century BC suggested that the Chinese might subjugate their rough northern enemies by enticing them with roast meats in eating houses on the empire's borders. When the Xiongnu have developed a craving, he said, for our cooked rice, gung stew, roasted meats and wine, this will have become their fatal weakness. If a barbarian did develop a taste for eating Chinese food, it was viewed as tantamount to submitting to Chinese rule. The ancient Chinese didn't avoid raw food completely. In fact, one great delicacy, kuai, consisted of raw or sometimes pickled meat or fish, a precursor of what would become Japanese sushi. But on the whole, to be Chinese, to be civilised and properly human, was to cook, to transform the world through fire and seasoning. This may all sound like ancient history, but it still reverberates in modern China, where, despite the recent appearance of leafy salads and sashimi on metropolitan restaurant menus, most food is transformed from its untouched natural state by heat or at least by pickling, and the old disdain for raw foods lingers. In Chinese, the word used to describe the delicious smells of roasting is xiang, typically translated into English as fragrant, yet far richer in its connotations, because xiang also refers to incense, to the smouldering aromatics whose smoke wafted heavenwards to the spirit world during ancient rites of sacrifice, along with the scents of sacrificial food. These rising tendrils of aroma, it was hoped, would attract the attention of the spirits who held sway over human destiny. In ancient and modern China, edible offerings were and are a conduit to the spirit world. On the fringes of the human realm hover a restless pack of gods, ghosts and ancestors, some of them malevolent, many simply ambivalent, but all thought to be susceptible to persuasion in the form of food and drink. The tempting aromas of the sacrifices, carrying messages into the ether like a sensory morse code, will, it is hoped, not only feed them, but win their favour, bringing good weather, plentiful harvests and general good fortune. So important were the sacrifices that the Book of Rites advised that preparing meals for spirits, whatever it cost, should take priority over feeding mortals. 
The ancient practice of petitioning spirits through the sense of food and wine has material echoes in contemporary society. Until President Xi Jinping's 2013 anti-corruption campaign threw a spanner into the works of official whining and dining, many high-end restaurants depended on business brought by customers trying to butter up influential people through food and drink. When Chinese specialist chefs do roast meats, their methods tend to be meticulous and sophisticated. Peking duck is made by a complex process designed to maximise the glossy crispness of the skin and the tender succulence of the flesh, involving inflation with a pump, wind drying, lacquering with a sugar solution, adding moisture and roasting while hanging in the fierce heat of a domed oven fuelled by a fruitwood fire. So different are Chinese roasts from English that members of the first British embassy to China in 1793 found the provisions supplied to them by their imperial hosts somewhat unpalatable. The roast meat, wrote Aeneas Anderson, one of the party, had a very singular appearance, as they use some preparation of oil that gives it a gloss like that of varnish, nor was its flavour so agreeable to our palates as the dishes produced by the clean and simple cookery of our European kitchens. For Westerners, great chunks of roasted meat cooked over fire are prized centrepieces of culinary culture. They are seen as hearty, straightforward, honest and masculine the steak flung on the barbecue, the Sunday roast carved ceremoniously by the male head of a household. But from a Chinese angle, while roasted meat might be delicious enough to tempt the spirits, it's also a little primitive, perhaps even atavistic, a relic of the origins of cooking rather than a reflection of civilised gastronomy. If roasting was the earliest cooking method, the Chinese have, in a sense, left it far behind. The cuisine that emerged from simple beginnings was one that emphasised the transformation of ingredients from their raw whole state into something less primitive and more conspicuously shaped by human endeavour. A practitioner of Chinese food culture cuts, seasons, transforms and civilizes his or her ingredients. Cooking was and is the practice of civilization. In that sense, a stir-fry of slivered meat and vegetables is more essentially Chinese than a slab of roast pork. In the restaurant in London's Chinatown, the waitress lays down my plate. The rosy-edged slices of cha shao pork are fanned out neatly on the steaming white rice, streaked with gravy, a few ribbons of blanched Chinese cabbage tucked in at the side. The archaic roast hunk of meat transformed into a Chinese dish. It's a classic Cantonese repast, sustaining, affordable and delicious. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Mrs Song's Fish Stew. Song Sao Yu Gung. Mrs Song's Fish Gung, or Chowder, is a speciality of the southeastern Chinese city of Hangzhou. The soup, neither solid nor completely liquid, is a swirling kaleidoscope of colour, like Venetian glass made edible, the flow of the ingredients held motionless by the starch that thickens the broth. The palette of colours is balanced. Morsels of white fish, golden wisps of egg yolk, slivers of dark mushroom and ivory bamboo shoot, a few shreds of pink ham and green spring onion to finish. The soup is made from a dozen different ingredients, but none clamours for individual attention. Together they blend harmoniously. Like many Hangzhou dishes, this one tells a story. 
around 900 years ago, after their northern capital had been overrun by nomadic invaders. The remnants of the Song Dynasty court fled south to Hangzhou. One day, during their exile, the emperor toured the West Lake on his boat and asked some floating traders for samples of their wares. Among them was a woman cook who boldly introduced herself as Fifth Sister-in-Law Song and told the emperor she was, like him, a refugee from the north and was making her living selling fish soup. The emperor, tasting her gung, a striking blend of northern cooking with southern ingredients, was so overcome by nostalgia for his lost homeland that he thanked Mrs Song with a gift of rolls of silk shot with silver and gold. In Chinese cuisine, there are two broad categories of soup, the tang and the gung. The tang is a refreshing, transparent broth that may include floating ingredients, but which is drunk rather than eaten. In contrast, a gung like Mrs Song's is a more substantial soup, almost a stew, dense with cut ingredients and often thickened with starch. Westerners often seem to favour sturdy gung over delicate tang, perhaps because the strained broths of the tang seem to Western palates watery and insubstantial, and therefore poor value, their fine ingredients invisible rather than thick on the tongue. The Chinese, meanwhile, drink tang with almost every meal. Gung are less essential, eaten occasionally rather than on a daily basis. Yet while the gung might now appear to be a mere bit-part player on the Chinese dinner table, it was once the most important of all Chinese dishes, and the gung arguably says more about the history and character of Chinese cooking than any other dish on the menu. A gung could be made from a single foodstuff, but usually, as with Mrs Song soup, it was a composition in which several different ingredients were combined. This approach of mixing and matching, of playing with complement and contrast, has been central to Chinese cooking for more than two millennia. The idea that cooking was a consummate skill, even a kind of alchemy, pervaded ancient literature. Governing a country, said the sage Lao Tzu, is like cooking small fish. To an English person who thinks cooking can be as easy as roasting a chicken and some potatoes, this might sound like a disparagement of government. But in Chinese terms, it was quite the opposite. An allusion to the acute sensitivity demanded both by governing a state and cooking delicate little fish to perfection. Specifically, in ancient Chinese literature, the art of government was often compared to seasoning a gung. In the 6th century BC, the political adviser Yenza said, Harmony may be compared to a gung. The cook blends the ingredients, equalising the stew by means of seasonings. Then his lord eats it and thus brings his heart at ease. So it is with the relations between ruler and minister. Effective government, as every ancient Chinese philosopher knew, requires the piquancy of critical voices, just as sour and bitter tastes are required to balance the easy appeal of sweetness in the gung. Harmony, in Mandarin Xie, these days can just be a euphemism for censorship, which is why in 2010 the dissident artist Ai Weiwei lampooned the notion by inviting his followers to a feast of river crabs. Their name, Xie in Mandarin, a homonym and therefore also a pun on harmony. 21st century China, devoid of the sharpness of criticism, is in danger of becoming not a well-seasoned stew, but a soporific can of bland tomato soup. The West Lake in Hangzhou, where Mrs Song once plied her trade, is endlessly, eternally beautiful. 
At nightfall, it feels as though the scene has changed little since Mrs. Song cooked aboard her boat 900 years ago, despite dynastic upheavals, rebellions, wars and revolution. The beauty of the lake settles my spirits, just as her gentle soup brings harmony to its ingredients and to the soul and stomach of anyone who eats it. Mapo tofu. Mapo tofu. Pockmarked Mrs. Chen, as she is fondly known, ran a restaurant near the Bridge of Ten Thousand Blessings in the north of Chengdu in the late 19th century. There she would rustle up a hearty braised tofu, lively with ruby red oil and zinging Sichuan pepper. So popular was the dish that it became part of local folklore, and in contemporary Chengdu, a chain of restaurants still bears Mrs Chen's name. Mapo tofu is a vivid expression of the central importance of the soybean in Chinese cooking and culinary culture. The recipe involves three different bean preparations. The tofu itself, made from coagulated soybean milk, Sichuan chili bean paste, made with fermented broad beans, and fermented black soybeans. Some people also add a little soy sauce, a fourth bean ingredient, and the third made from soybeans. In the dish, the soybean is simultaneously the main ingredient, the principal source of protein, and a flavouring. The Chinese eat various types of bean, but none is more significant than soy. The soybean offers the same sort of nutrition as dairy products, but more economically. It contains twice the protein of any other legume and all the amino acids essential for human health. In recent years, soy's reputation in the West has been tainted by its association with the clearing of Amazonian rainforests to grow vast monocrops of genetically engineered beans. But such destructive farming is a consequence of the world's growing hunger for meat, rather than the production of traditional East Asian soy foods. More than three quarters of the soybeans grown globally are used to feed cows, pigs and chickens destined for human consumption, a spectacularly inefficient means of producing protein. In China, people first domesticated the soybean around the year 1000 BC, but it was the radical innovations of subjecting it to fermentation and, much later, making tofu, that would transform not only the Chinese diet, but eventually those of Japan and Korea too. A soybean hardly seems promising. Dried yellow soybeans have to be soaked and boiled for hours before they are remotely palatable. Yet this dismal bean turned out to be a casket of wonders that could be unlocked to reveal the richest source of plant protein on the planet, not to mention a suite of exciting tastes and textures. In modern times, liquid soy sauce is the archetypal Chinese seasoning found in kitchens all over the world. It is made by soaking and steaming yellow or black soybeans, mixing them with wheat flour and then leaving them in dark, warm, humid conditions to be colonised by Aspergillus orizae moulds. When the fermentation is complete, the liquid soy sauce is strained off from the solid beans. Fermented soybeans and other legumes provided the rich, savoury, almost meaty tastes that could make a largely vegetarian diet palatable. Dip steamed aubergines in soy sauce and they feel more like a main course. Add some fermented black beans to a walkful of leafy greens and they become substantial and satisfying. Such dishes are typical examples of a common Chinese culinary strategy in which strongly flavoured salt fermented foods are cooked with mild, fresh ingredients to make them more appetising, or, as they say in Chinese, xian xian he yi, salty and fresh combined. As for mapo tofu, 
Although the classic dish also involves a little minced meat, you hardly need it because the chorus of chunky chilli bean sauce and black beans is already so magnificent. In their kitchen in Huayuan, not far from Chengdu, Wang Xiufang and her husband Fu Wenzhong are making tofu the traditional way. Two heavy circular stones are sandwiched together on top of a wooden frame, making a quern, that spans a great iron wok. Wang spoons soaked yellow soybeans, a few at a time, with a trickle of water, into a hole in the upper stone and turns its wooden handle. The upper stone grinds against the lower and the beans are crushed between their ridges, the milk spilling lazily down the sides of the lower stone and pooling in the wok below. When all the beans are gone and the wok is half filled with pale, frothy liquid, Fu removes the quern and lights a fire beneath the pot. Wang stirs and scrapes rhythmically as the firewood crackles in the bright glow of the flames and slowly the milk comes to the boil. Together they strain the hot milk through a bag of muslin and return it to the wok. After the milk has come to a simmer, Wang uses chopsticks to whip off the skins that form on the surface and then gradually stirs in a solution of mineral salts and curds begin to form like clouds beneath the surface. She covers the pot with a lid and a few minutes later the tofu is made. Fu casts a chopstick into the pot like an arrow and it stands upright, held in the set of the curds. The sign, he tells me, that it's ready. Soon afterwards, we all gather around the table. At its centre, a large china bowl holding great clumps of tofu, pale as the moon in their thin golden way. We spoon them into bowls and, with our chopsticks, pluck off tufts to dip in saucers of inky soy sauce mixed with ground chilies and Sichuan pepper and chopped spring onions. It has the soothing freshness of Sicilian ricotta without the sheepiness, and the seasonings are quintessentially Sichuanese. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Braised pomelo pith with shrimp eggs. Xia zi you pi. If you don't know this dish, you'll never guess what you're eating. One or two smooth domes of something in a sleek brown sauce speckled with the minuscule dark dots of shrimp eggs. Scoop some up in the serving spoon, transfer it to your bowl and eat. Whatever it is just holds its shape but has a soft mashed potato texture. Eating it is pure comfort. The pomelo is a large citrus fruit, and pomelo pith with shrimp eggs is a Cantonese speciality, so beloved that local farmers have developed a dedicated variety of the fruit that has thick pith and hardly any flesh. A bit like breeding a chicken that is all wing and cartilage, which no doubt they would do too if they could. Preparing pomelo pith for cooking is laborious and time-consuming. First, the thin, shiny outer skin is peeled away or burnt off in a naked flame. The pith is then cut into large pieces and soaked in cold water for two or more days with regular squeezing and changes of water to remove any bitterness. Next, it is simmered for several hours in a luxurious broth made from toasted dried flounder, pork and other ingredients that may include fresh dace, dried shrimps, ham rind and aromatics such as garlic or spring onion. Finally, when it has sucked up all the flavours of the broth, some of the liquid is reduced and a little oyster sauce is added, along with the delicious shrimp eggs, which have been gently toasted, and it is then poured over the gentle mounds of pith in a serving dish. A final sprinkling of shrimp eggs may follow. 
It is hard to imagine how or why anyone thought of turning the unpromising middle layer of this fruit, about as appealing in its raw state as cotton wool, into something so magnificent. But whoever did was Chinese, and in China such startling culinary imagination and technical ingenuity is typical. Virtually no ingredient is too humble or too unlikely to resist transformation in the hands of a skilled Chinese cook. A sow's ear can be magicked into the culinary equivalent of a silk purse, a lip-zinging salad perhaps. Peelings of white radish skin make a snap-snap crisp-crisp pickle. Some Sichuanese even enjoy eating the intensely chewy upper palates of pigs steeped in spicy oil, which they call paradise. Tiantang. What is an ingredient, anyway? Most people can probably agree that it must be edible. But what is edible? Clearly, the answer to this question is highly subjective and culturally specific. Someone typically English might consider edible the rotten blue cheese that would horrify many Chinese, while being simultaneously appalled by the French predilection for snails and frogs' legs. We all have our own answers to the question: Can I eat this? But aside from such cultural differences, it has long seemed to me that for a skilled Chinese chef. Not only the answer, but the question itself is profoundly and even philosophically different from that posed by any typical Westerner. The question for a Chinese chef is not, "Is this edible?" but "How can I make this edible?" An improbable ingredient such as pomelo pith is like a gauntlet tossed upon the kitchen table. There's not much anyone can do to improve a perfectly ripe peach, which is why people in China, where the peach originated, normally just eat them as they are. But most potential ingredients are more ambiguous. Even conventional meats and fish have their imperfections. My teachers at the Sichuan Higher Institute of Cuisine in the 1990s. Taught me that many animal and some vegetable ingredients had unpleasant edges to their flavors, that we needed to subdue through blanching, marinating, and the judicious use of seasonings. In the kitchen, all ingredients have their qualities, however slim, and the job of the Chinese cook is not to dismiss them because of their flaws, but to examine these qualities and see how they might conceivably be brought into play. To take an obvious example, a stringy old hen is clearly poor material for a succulent poached chicken dish, but will make a superb broth, for which it is far more suitable than a plump, juicy capon. Most parts of most plants and animals have some redeeming features. Just because pomelo skin is colourless, dull, and cottony, does not mean that it cannot be a potential ingredient. The fact that a chicken's foot is bare of meat doesn't rule it out as a delicacy. It's all about technique, creativity, and imagination. Catfish basking in honors. Tubu lo lian. It is raining when I arrive in Longjing one September afternoon. Someone greets me at the entrance to the Dragonwell Manor with an umbrella, and shelters me through the sodden garden, the surrounding hills blurred by mist and water, the rain scribbling violent patterns on the surface of the pond. We walk up stone steps to the main hall, and then into a side room lined with exotic stones on wooden plinths, where Adai is waiting for me. The chef has arranged a special dinner for the two of us. Red braised paddle, a Hangzhou speciality, is made with the tail of a giant carp, and named after the way it swishes powerfully through the water. The tail is braised in stock with Shaoxing wine, dark soy sauce, and sugar, until its most intimate secretions have melted into the liquid, yielding a sauce as dark as mahogany and rich as double cream. 
You should only eat a giant carp's tail in the company of someone you know well, because it's a brazenly messy business with an unavoidable soundtrack of sucks and slurps. The only actual flesh is a tiny nugget cradled in a curve of cartilage at the distal end of the tail, which you might even tackle with chopsticks. After this easy picking, you must take the tail in your fingers so you can prise apart its two layers of spines, which are interleaved with thin seams of a sticky ambrosial jelly. This you will want to lick out like nectar, using your teeth to scrape and your tongue to suck along each quill to extract every last delicious thread leaving nothing but clean spines on the plate. Of course, we wouldn't serve this to a normal foreigner, says Adai, eyeing the ecstatic, sore-strenched me sitting opposite him. I lick my lips and carry on prizing out my treasure. By the time we have finished, our hands, lips and cheeks are streaky with sauce, glossy with dark molten jelly. Outside, the rain still drips softly through the osmanthus trees. Chinese people take enormous pleasure in the physicality of what they eat, another reason for their adventurous approach to ingredients. Good food, in a Chinese context, is about tactility as much as flavour. It is a lively dialogue between the food and the lips, teeth and tongue, a successful dish, as my cooking school teachers always used to say, must hit all the targets of se xiang wei xing, colour, fragrance, flavour and form. It should first delight the eyes with its beauty, then the nose with its scent, the tongue with its tastes, and the palate with its material qualities. Kou gan, literally mouth feel, is an essential part of the enjoyment of eating which is an all-embracing sensory experience. Anyone who grew up in a Western culinary tradition may wonder, quite reasonably, why anyone would bother to eat a duck's tongue or a fish tail. There's even less meat than there is on a fish tail on a duck's tongue. None at all, in fact. It is a tiny, fiddly thing, barely more than a few prongs of bone and cartilage encased in rubbery skin with what my father calls a high grapple factor. Eating it is a negotiation. You cannot simply chomp and swallow. It makes no sense at all in terms of Western gastronomy, which tends to shun complication and prize neat flesh. Why trouble yourself with all the grapple for so little reward? Delight in the tactile complexity of intricate parts is just one aspect of the appreciation of texture in Chinese gastronomy. When Chinese people discuss something they have eaten, they rarely omit mention of its mouthfeel. Were the bamboo shoots crisp, fresh and youthful? None. Or a bit elderly and fibrous? Lao. Were the goose intestines nice and snappy? Cui. No Cantonese gourmet is satisfied with a steamed hargao dumpling if the prawns inside lack the requisite bouncy crispness only achieved through lengthy preparations. Dim sum aimed at the Western market is often lacking in pertness, as far from the Cantonese original as a couch potato is from an Olympic athlete. The Chinese appreciate all the textures enjoyed by Westerners, the dry, shattering crispness of the batter enclosing a deep-fried prawn, the fragrant crispness of roast chicken skin, the creamy wobble of a custard, the airy voluptuousness of a mousse. But they also enjoy the cool sliminess of okra, taro and mallows, which are often rejected by non-Asian palates. And there's another whole category of textures that the Chinese adore and Westerners mostly disdain, which is the category of slithery or wetly crunchy animal foods. At the more modest social level, there is tripe, smooth, honeycombed or frilly like the pages of a book. The gristle in chicken's feet or pork trotters 
skiddy duck or goose intestines and slippery jellyfish. At the highest social echelons are most of the grand old delicacies of Chinese cuisine, shark's fin, sea cucumber, deer tendons and bird's nest, which is made from the dried saliva of tiny swiftlets. Each of these ingredients is fabulously expensive, laborious to prepare, slithery or wetly crunchy after reconstitution from their dried state, and, before their final cooking, completely flavourless. Countless Westerners have told me that they had simply never considered that one could consciously explore the texture of food for its own sake. Just becoming aware of the importance of texture in Chinese cuisine enabled them to open a new door of perception, and suddenly a whole field of delicacies that had before seemed baffling began to make sense. Learning how to appreciate texture allowed me to fully share in the joys of eating with my Chinese friends. I stopped being a foreigner at the table with my own boundaries and prejudices and became a participant. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Knife scraped noodles. Dao Xiao Mian. In the kitchens of the little South Street noodle restaurant in Datong in northern Shanxi province, the chef balances the wooden board on his shoulder like a violin. On it rests a block of smooth, stiff dough. Standing before the great simmering wok, in its breathing cloud of steam, he begins his performance. With his right hand, he raises, like a bow, a flat piece of shining metal with a sharpened curl at the top, and draws it down the dough, scraping off a long strip of noodle that dives through the air and into the pot. Transfixed, I watch as he repeats the action again and again, and the noodles, each with its idiosyncratic curves and tapered edges, flit through the steam to jostle, eel-like, in the bubbling water. He strains them into a bowl, hands it to his colleague, and she adds a ladleful of stewed pork, a hard-boiled egg, a tofu fritter and a meatball or two, sprinkles over coriander, and then hands me the steaming bowl. The soup is savoury, the noodles silken yet chewy, their varied size and thickness utterly pleasing in the mouth. Knife scraped noodles, Dao Xiao Mian, the pride of Datong. When people in the West think of pasta, it's almost invariably Italy, with its myriad interpretations of flour and egg, that first springs to mind. China may be known for noodles but few types, relatively speaking, are famous internationally. In the early days of Chinese food abroad, Chinese pasta usually meant chow mein, literally stir-fried noodles, a tangle of golden egg noodles with bean sprouts and other slivered ingredients. Chow mein has always been wildly popular with foreigners, but it's strikingly unrepresentative of Chinese noodle culture, partly because chow mein is a southern Cantonese dish, while noodles are mainly a northern Chinese staple, and partly because Chinese people, especially in the north, generally prefer their pasta sourced or soupy. In recent years, a small vanguard of northern Chinese noodle makers have begun to attract attention in western cities, mainly with the broad, hand-stretched biang biang noodles of Xi'an, and the long hand-pulled la mian of Lanzhou. Both are prepared by drawing an elastic wheaten dough out between the hands in mid-air until it is transfigured into flat ribbons in the first case or string noodles in the second. But while these specialities offer a glimpse of the technical ingenuity of Chinese noodle making, they are just two of a vast panorama of Chinese pasta types most of which are totally unknown abroad. 
Noodles are eaten as a staple food across a great swathe of northern China. And while every region has its own specialities, nowhere is more renowned within China for its dough arts than Shanxi province. Near Datong, the Yungang grottoes, with their dazzling fusion of Indian and Chinese art, are one legacy of the flow of trade and culture along the Silk Road. For centuries, until the sea trade rose to dominance during the Ming Dynasty, camel caravans plied their way between China and the Western lands, exporting silk, tea and other Chinese goods, and bringing in Western ideas, technologies and foodstuffs some of which would have transformative effects on Chinese culture and cuisine. Few imports, though, would have a greater effect on Chinese life and the sum of Chinese happiness than the arrival of flour-milling technology from Central Asia. By the time of the Han Dynasty, some 2,000 years ago, the Chinese had adopted from their Western neighbours the rotary quern, a sandwich of two round millstones, between which stubborn wheat could be ground to silky flour. Around this time, a new word, bing, became current in the Chinese language, made from the pictogram for food, fused with the old word for to combine, and used not only for noodles, but for all kinds of foods made from a dough mixed from wheat flour and water. By the end of the Tang dynasty, towards the end of the first millennium, there were so many dough foods that the use of the word bing was increasingly limited to flatbreads, while types of pasta were becoming known as mian from the word for flour, as they still are today. The consumption of foods made from wheat and doughs had by then already become one of the habits that distinguished people in China as northerners along with eating mutton and dairy foods. During subsequent dynasties, pasta foods became popular throughout China, but they would never become as important in the diets of people in southern parts as they were in the north. Over a few days of dedicated noodle eating in Shanxi, I sample numerous varieties, but have clearly only picked at the surface of the Shanxi noodle arts. There are pastas made by dipping cooked vegetables in runny dough, squeezing soft dough through the fingers, or rubbing nuggets of firm dough across wooden ridges into long curls that resemble caterpillars. In a region where fresh ingredients are fewer than in the south, Shanxi people have been wildly imaginative in handling flours made of wheat, potatoes, oats, corn, millet, sorghum and beans. Everything you can think of doing with dough, Shanxi cooks have tried. Snipping, shaving, grating, rolling, smearing, slicing, pinching, dripping, tearing, pulling, rubbing. They have special knives and sticks and boards and graters, but most pastas are shaped by hand. And of course, Shanxi is just a small province about half the size of Italy and only one among a clutch of northern Chinese provinces with their own noodle specialities. Chinese noodles are almost always rustled up on the spot, to order, by skilled artisans who transform the dough before your eyes. Handmade Chinese noodles of any kind are still few and far between in western cities. Until Shanxi noodle makers grace our cities with their presence and their craft, or teach a whole squadron of apprentices, we can only dream of their flour foods. If Italian dried pasta is like a CD or a digital download, easy to transport and replicate, Chinese noodles are like going to the opera. You have to be there. Steamed soup dumplings. Xiaolongbao. About a dozen chefs, most of them women, sit around two long tables in the light-filled room. Golden towers of bamboo steamers are stacked around them to varying heights. Here and there are dishes piled high with minced pork filling, flecked with fat, spring onion and ginger. 
Each chef, clad in whites and a floppy white cap, works in quiet concentration, wrapping dumplings with incredible speed. The women are so fast that in an hour, they claim, they can each fill 20 steamers with 400 dumplings, each one with more than a dozen tiny pleats. Next door, in the dining room of the Gui Garden Restaurant in Nanxiang, on the outskirts of Shanghai, the first customers are sitting down for lunch. It's an old-fashioned hall with a sweeping tiled roof and latticed windows, right next to the classical garden after which the restaurant is named, now a public park with scattered pavilions, ponds and walkways. I join some diners at a communal round table and order my own steamer full of dumplings, along with a bowl full of soup. The small dumplings have relaxed in the heat and slumped easily against one another on the straw mat that lines the steamer. I pick one up with my chopsticks, and its bottom swells with the weight of the stock inside. I dip it in rice vinegar poured from a teapot on the table and hold it over my china spoon as I raise it to my lips. When I bite into the fluffy wrapper, a flush of savoury stock pools in the spoon, and then I eat the whole thing and chase it down with the remaining liquid. The Taiwan restaurant chain Din Tai Feng may have brought the steamed soup dumpling, or xiaolong bao, to global attention, but it's actually best known as a Shanghainese speciality. It is said to have originated here in Nanxiang, where it is known as mantou. And within this name mantou lies hidden a fascinating story of Silk Road trade routes, dynastic upheavals, cultural and culinary exchanges, and the entire history of the dainty snacks now known as dim sum. In the 3rd century AD, so the story goes, when the statesman Zhuge Liang was waging a military campaign against the Man barbarian tribes on the southern fringes of the empire, his troops fell into difficulties when trying to cross a river. He was advised to propitiate the local spirits with offerings of the heads of the Man barbarians in Chinese mantou, in the hope that they would help him on his way. Unwilling to engage in wanton slaughter, Zhuge Liang fooled the gods by offering them dough balls stuffed with meat instead of human heads. It's a fabulous story, but unlikely to contain any grain of truth, as it appears in Chinese literature hundreds of years after Zhuge Liang's supposed southern adventures, and centuries after the word manto appears in Chinese. In fact, a linguistic origin for manto in some old Turkic language seems highly likely, because the Chinese term is so similar to words for stuffed pastas that appear across continental Asia. In Xinjiang, the Turkic-speaking Uyghur calls steamed dumplings stuffed with mutton and onion manta, while the Turks eat a whole range of different stuffed pastas, also called manta, from tiny dumplings smothered in yoghurt, melted butter and chilli, to larger dumplings that resemble Chinese jiaozi. By the time of the Tang dynasty, several other of China's most distinctive modern snacks were already on the scene, including wontons and the spring pancakes, known as chunbing, that would later be wrapped around fillings to become spring rolls. During this time, the word dim sum came into use. Originally, it was a verb that meant to have a little something between meals. One text describes three ladies lighting the lamps, laying out some freshly made flatbreads, and then dim summing with their guests. By the Song dynasty, dim sum had become the noun it is today, used to describe all manner of dainty snacks, including dumplings, buns, cakes and fritters. In recent times, the Xiaolong Bao, the steamed soup dumpling, has made its proud entrance onto the global stage, followed, so far more tentatively, by another Shanghainese treat, the raw fried bun, or sheng jian bao, 
a juicy pork dumpling, usually made of risen dough, that is simultaneously fried and steamed, giving it a gorgeously golden, toasty base. But all these delicious snacks are just the beginning of any exploration of the realm of dim sum. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Dry fried eels. Ganbian shan yu. In a courtyard of the Temple of Divine Light in Xindu, a few visitors are lighting bundles of pink incense sticks, making their bows and murmuring prayers, before planting the sticks in a bed of ashes in an enormous bronze censer. It's a typical Sichuan day, humid and overcast. After a while, we saunter over to the tea house, a great courtyard shaded by tall trees where a few groups of people are sitting in bamboo chairs, playing cards and sipping green tea. Soon it is time for lunch. We find a table outside, and I request a platter of cold meats, fish-fragrant pork slivers, dry-fried eels, spare ribs in black bean sauce. Before long, our table is covered in dishes. It all looks like a typical Chengdu meal. But while it appears typical, all the food is vegetarian. The so-called eels are strips of shiitake mushroom fried in batter and tossed in a wok with green peppers. The spare ribs are puffs of fried gluten impaled on lotus root battens. And the supposed fish is mashed potato encased in golden tofu skin. The food not only looks convincing, Most of it tastes and feels convincing too. It is not merely trompe l'oeil, deceive the eye. It is also designed to deceive the palate. In recent years in Western countries, there's been a sudden rush in demand for plant-based foods as the arguments for avoiding meat, fish and dairy ingredients, or at least eating less of them, have become more compelling. The role of animal-derived methane in the climate crisis, the pollution and cruelty involved in factory farming, and the pillaging of the oceans by giant trawlers have all made eating the products of living creatures more of a moral minefield than it was before. New companies are at the forefront of a push to develop convincing facsimiles of meat. Amid all this innovation by Western food manufacturers, Few in the West seem to realise that the Chinese have been devising ways of using plant foods to mimic meat for more than a thousand years. Our vegetarian lunch at the Temple of Divine Light is part of a tradition that dates back at least to the Tang Dynasty when a devoutly Buddhist official, Cui Antian, hosted a banquet at which he served remarkably realistic replicas of pork shoulder, leg of lamb and other meats made from plant ingredients. For Buddhists, abstaining from meat was a way of cultivating compassion and avoiding karmic responsibility for killing. Like the Muslim rejection of pork, the avoidance of meat by Chinese Buddhists has always been countercultural in a nation where, for the majority, Meat represents wealth, community and celebration, and where the word home is a character that depicts a pig under a roof. Of course, when it comes to producing meat-free food, China has several edible advantages, including fermented jiang sauces, tofu in all its forms, and wheat gluten. All three, along with mushrooms and bamboo shoots, have long been staples of vegetarian cooking. Fermented legumes and cereals, especially the soybean, provide the savoury, full-bodied flavours that help to make plant foods as satisfying as meat. All across modern China, chefs magic up vegetarian versions of local dishes. In Sichuan, they make so-called numbing and hot dried beef from the stalks of shiitake mushrooms. 
In southern Chaozhou, they make deep-fried vegetarian wontons with chunks of pineapple in a sweet-sour sauce. One Shanghai restaurant chain that is reshaping modern Chinese vegetarian cuisine is Wu Jie, which means no boundaries in English. The food at Wu Jie is stunningly presented and lavishly flavorful. The intention is to show people that vegetarian food does not have to be bland, and that avoiding meat can be a positive, fashionable life choice rather than one born of poverty. The menu includes several imitation meat dishes, such as a brilliant version of the Sichuanese classic, man and wife offal slices, glossy with chili oil and made with slices of king oyster and elmer mushrooms. That perfectly evoke the appearance and texture of the tripe and ox meat in the original dish. There are signs that the Western world may be about to wake up to what China has to offer to those who would eat less meat. Ironically, however, just as Western chefs and food producers are jumping on to the particular bandwagon of imitation meat, those at the cutting edge of Chinese catering. Are exploring the possibility of jumping off. Chongqing chicken in a pile of chilies. La zi ji. When I take groups of foreigners on gastronomic tours of China, my favourite moments are those when we move dramatically from one culinary region to another. We begin in Beijing. Visiting the Forbidden City, the Great Wall, and the Temple of Heaven, and eating Peking duck, Jiajiang noodles, and other local delicacies. Onwards, then, we go to Xi'an, with its terracotta army and Muslim town, its stewed mutton with soaked flatbreads, and array of fascinating street foods. Afterwards, we take the train to Chengdu for a few days of spicy Sichuanese food. And then head to Shanghai and Hangzhou for a taste of Jiangnan. Leaving Xi'an for Chengdu, we bid farewell to wheat country and enter the domain of rice. We turn our backs on the dominance of dark vinegar and raw garlic for the roller coaster ride of Sichuanese flavors with their wild combinations of spice and sweetness, of chilly heat and numbing Sichuan pepper. We leave the arid north for the humid south, immersing ourselves in an entirely different dialect and lifestyle. And then, arriving in Shanghai, we shed the scintillating heat of chilies and the tingle of Sichuan pepper, and find ourselves in a world of delicate flavors and culinary refinement, of fish and rice and other watery ingredients. Moments of transition like these challenge the whole notion of what we call Chinese cuisine. Sure, there are some commonalities: the use of chopsticks and the cutting of food into small pieces, the centrality of fermented legumes and tofu, the lack of dairy foods, and the ubiquity of steaming and stir frying. But beyond these generalities. Chinese local and regional traditions are so diverse that they resist a unifying definition. China, with its vast geographical diversity, is more like a continent than a nation. This tapestry of lands and climates supplies the biodiversity that makes possible the range and richness of the Chinese larder. In the northwest, you can eat locally produced hami melons, sand onions, pomegranates, and camel meat. In the northeast, walnuts, mountain haws, and the ovarian fat of the Siberian forest frog, just to pluck a few examples. In Yunnan, depending on where you are exactly, you can dine on fresh matsutake and numerous other wild mushrooms, bananas and papayas picked warm from the tree. Or yak meat, roasted barley, and yak butter tea. In the twenty-first century, Sichuanese cuisine has risen to prominence as China's most popular regional style, and its most successful culinary export. One day in September, I joined three local chefs for a pilgrimage to the famous Happiness in the Woods restaurant at Gurle Mountain on the outskirts of the city of Chongqing. 
we left behind the urban thicket of skyscrapers on the Yangtze River and drove up a winding road lush with trees and creepers. Like everyone else at the restaurant, we were there to eat their signature dish, chicken with chilies, la ji. The restaurant's main kitchen was downstairs, but upstairs there was a special kitchen devoted only to this dish. Outside it were stacked ten enormous sacks of dried chilies. The owner, Xia Jun, a woman with hair dyed the colour of scorched chilies, told me they could get through that amount on a single day. Inside the kitchen, four chefs were engaged in relentless Ladziji production. Two of them stood at wooden chopping blocks, reducing chicken after chicken to bite-sized chunks. I watched, mesmerised, as the other two, a man and a woman, commanded their walks. They tipped bucketfuls of chilies into their cauldrons of oil and then added handfuls of Sichuan pepper. They stirred and stirred in the fiendish heat as the spices sizzled before chucking in the chicken, followed by a glug of soy sauce and later a scattering of MSG. Then they scooped the whole lot onto a tray the size of a satellite dish and sprinkled over a few sesame seeds. And then they started all over again. My friends and I devoured the chicken, rummaging with our chopsticks in the pile of chilies for its fragrant morsels, mopping our brows with tissues, swigging iced beer and spitting out the bones on the disposable tablecloth. In between attacks on the chicken, we picked slippery slices of fish out of a huge bowl of soup that was practically radioactive with green Sichuan pepper. We nibbled strips of eel which had been dry-fried with plenty of chilli and pepper and tasted slices of silk gourd stir-fried with dried chilies and chunks of a spicy lotus root salad. Occasionally, for light relief, we took a sip of a light broth afloat with jellied chicken's blood and seasonal greens. The meal was typical not only of Chongqing cooking, but of a particular style called river and lake dishes, Jianghu Cai, which has been wildly trendy in recent years. This is hearty folk cooking, eaten in cacophonous restaurants with wild abandon. My visit to the happiness in the woods was part of the research for a revised edition of my Sichuan cookbook, originally published two decades before. Keen to deepen my knowledge of the region, I explored the byways of the province. Every county town I visited had its own specialities. Artisanal pickles, dishes, stews, snacks and sweetmeats. All in all, China is a breathtaking patchwork of cuisines that blend in and out of each other and are in a constant state of flux. You can travel and travel and travel around the country and taste new foods every single day, which is pretty much what I've been doing for the last 30 years. And after all this time, I still find myself in the same state of wonder and bewilderment. Chinese cuisine is like a fractal pattern that becomes more and more intricate the more closely you examine it, to a seemingly infinite degree. All over the country, people are tucking into remarkably delicious and locally distinctive foods. At some profound level, this is how China expresses itself, from ancient times until now, from now until eternity.